I felt very distinctly when Sister Linda was singing in the spirit, and there was an evident witness with it that it was Holy Spirit activity, that it was a love song. And uh, tonight what I want to do is something that I rarely do, and it's something I said I would never do. I want to open the book to the Song of Solomon and share a few things with you. It is acknowledged to be the most difficult book in the Old Testament to interpret. And as such, I will just share some fragments with you. Praise the Lord. I might begin with a, what's just a little insight, an interesting one. I shared it with a few people. I read it in a book somewhere. I think it's very fascinating. But in the Old Testament, the most difficult book to interpret is the Song of Solomon, according to scholars, thinkers, and commentators. And uh, I like to read comments upon scriptures, and I don't despise anybody's thoughts about the Bible because I find it to be many times a baffling book and uh, doesn't yield to me all the understanding I would like it to. And I found that one of the solutions is to get down low, humble yourself, accept those little fragments God does give you. I believe one of God's ways of dealing is if you, he'll give you a little, if you'll accept it, then he'll give you more. In fact, years ago when I was 20... Two years old, probably. An outstanding man of God gave me a word. I preached for a Friday night Assemblies of God Young People's Meeting in Roaring Spring, Pennsylvania. And the pastor there was a truly remarkable. He worshipped a lot like Annette Marsnick. And he knew God. He'd been in much visitation. He got a prophecy from one of the original Azusa Street women that he would prosper financially when he only had a nickel. And it came to pass so positively. As soon as he obeyed God, finances flowed to him the rest of his life. It was God talking. So I preached in my Pentecostal style of those days, which is rather vehement, and maybe overdone. You know how it is when we're young. I, you wouldn't have wanted to see me back in those days, probably. God kept me shielded. It kept people shielded from me, I guess, for a number of years. I waited on the Lord a long time. And after the meeting, he said, Brother Wilbur, his name was Brother David Lloyd Wyant. He said, God wants you to go and give what you have, and when you do, he'll give you more. And I rejected his word that night. I didn't tell him that, but I was always a great one to inwardly reject things. <laughs> and uh, after some more years went by, I finally had to act on his word anyway, and go and give what I had, and then the Lord gave me more. That may be so with some of you here tonight. The Lord may... Who, who has despised the day of small things? I, I'm afraid I have that tendency to despise the day of small things. Well, maybe I could repent in the pulpit tonight and affirm the day of small things. and Say, I am here in the pulpit with small things and I, I affirm it and I revel in it and I glory in it. Thank the Lord for the small things. Amen? Amen? Small things that are real are better than big phony representations or shows. Can you say amen? amen. And so the Song of Solomon, they say, and I guess I would agree with them, is the hardest book to interpret in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, without a doubt, it's the book of Revelation. And there, there's a word in each of these books that more or less it's as though they're addressing each other. And uh, in the last verse of the Song of Solomon, 8.14, the bride says, Make haste, my beloved. <laughs> About a month ago, some man somewhere made a big deal to me out of not saying beloved. He said, "That's we don't talk like that anymore. And, I mean, he talked to me for 15 minutes about not saying beloved. So tonight, as I read this book, I'm going to say beloved and not beloved in honor of whoever that was out in the Midwest to talk to me. <laughs> Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of spices. See, but get that idea. Make haste, my beloved. 
And in the book of Revelation, in the next to the last verse, just before the benediction, verse 20 of Revelation 22 says, He who testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. <laughs> it's like an antiphonal question and answer in the Bible itself. Make haste, my beloved. Surely I come quickly. <laughs> He's coming more quickly than we think he is. Hallelujah. And I've been rather delighted in the last couple of years. I'm going to see Jesus Christ bring the world to an end. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's going to burn it up with his truth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to God. <laughs> truth in its intensest form. <laughs> Consume the world. Bring in a better order. And all these wrestlings we had today or yesterday, or this week, or this, they'll all be gone. Hallelujah. I preach the good news tonight. There's a new day and a new order coming. Jesus will bring it in. Hallelujah. So, out of this book, which Brother Taylor dwells on so much, and I never have, and as I say, declared I would never speak from it, I, I want to share a few fragments with you tonight. Just a few verses and a few comments. First, I think I'll look at a verse in chapter number 2. This relates to some, some things that a lot of people have said to me. It relates to the situation we're in. Song of Solomon, and this is a love song, remember, it's a divine love song. To a Hebrew, to a Jew, it's a song between Israel and Jehovah. And uh, they had a certain historical way of dealing with this and relating, relating it to the coming out of Egypt. And uh, I want to tell you that tonight, more than ever before, I appreciate being delivered from Egyptian bondage. And what that means to me in simplicity is you do not have to be a slave in this world to have bread to eat and clothes to put on and a car to drive and a house to live in. Did you hear me? I want the underlying theme of my uh, little speech to you tonight to be that Jesus Christ sets us free. Hallelujah. He is the great liberator. And he can liberate astonishingly. I, I will never get tired of testimonies of hearing how Jesus Christ sets human beings free. And I know there are several in here tonight who would delightedly be set free from a psychological hang-up or a burden in their life. One of the nicest testimonies I heard was my wife told me what an elder sister told her in Bethesda in Detroit one day. That was Mrs. Beale's church. And my wife was standing beside an aged Polish lady that day. She was, I guess, 70 to 75, am I right? And she wept a great deal through the service. I don't know her name. My wife doesn't know her name. And she cried and cried and cried, and she turned to her bird and said, you probably wonder why I'm crying so much. She said, well, I was a hopeless schizophrenic, and I was in the mental institution. And one day, a moment of mental lucidity came over me. My mind cleared just for a moment. And in that moment, she said, I cried to heaven and said, Lord, save me. And down from heaven there came, as it were, a bolt of divine power, uh, gracious in its intent and struck that woman in in a moment of time took away her extreme schizophrenia and when Jesus did that she said it was as though I awakened I looked around and I said what am I doing in this place because she was totally normal the authorities watched her for two weeks called her family and said come and take your mother away she doesn't belong here a case where Jesus Christ the Savior looked down upon an aged Polish woman in some Michigan mental institution, and in a moment of time, by asserting his omnipotence, that he won the right to assert by dying on Calvary's cross, that when Satan comes and brings a charge against him. Oh, John Vick, the Norwegian pastor in Manhattan, had a masterful sermon titled, Hell Can Bring No Charge Against Him. <laughs> To every charge hell brings, he points to Calvary's cross and says, I died there. I shed divine blood on that cross. 
I just read a masterful sermon by Alexander White, the great Scottish preacher, where he quotes Paul, purchased the church with God, purchased the church with his own blood, the, perhaps the most extreme assertion in the whole Bible. You should get the book and read it. God purchased the church with his own blood. <laughs> and he has the legal right to deliver people in his own name, his own power, his own prerogatives, and establish his church anywhere and everywhere from the jungles to the northern mountains. Oh, I have heard testimony upon testimony upon testimony, and I love to recite them because it shows the activity of the Christ in history. In fact, the thinkers say the Christian mission is the history-making force in the world. Glory be to God. <laughs> I don't care if the church looks decrepit and feeble and defeated in many ways today. I know that her heart is sound. And she will always revive again and shake the world with the news that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He came to this world and did a decisive work. I had not planned to declare the gospel from the Song of Solomon tonight. But something triggered those things. And there is indeed a love song in the universe tonight being sung between the Lord and his bride. And I want to tell you something. The head would never rise and leave his body behind. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, if I were wealthy and my head was served for my body, I'd get the world's best surgeon and pay all my fortune to get my head and body back together again. <laughs> but I thought what I would do is read chapter 2 and verse 10 to begin with. I'm, I'm going to share, I don't know, half a dozen verses, say a few things. I believe that this will become a message, a more coherent message eventually. The Lord began to give it a year, year and a half ago in Brother Taylor's class, where I thought that I would never be able to get anything out of the Song of Solomon. And I read it over and I got impressed. Three things I think impressed me. I never was impressed with it. I read the Bible over and over and over and I never got this impression, but all of a sudden I got a brand new impression from the Song of Solomon. And that is this. It is a book full of smells and flavors and excursions to different places. <laughs> One could easily put together a message called spiritual progression. And I'm not a works man. I hope you all know that. And I hope that I know that I'm not utterly devoid of the works that rise out of grace itself. How about you? Amen. Praise the Lord. And you know, as somebody shared tonight, and different things were said that bore upon some of the things I'm going to say, an Old Testament scripture that has impressed me is, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. There are some of us who are not drawn intellectually. We're drawn by something that is subliminal or subrational, and it's a flavor we get. <laughs> and there is a flavor in modern society that is utterly contradictory to the flavor that comes out from the Lord himself. I know that if you build a restaurant at any old place in the world and cooked good enough, I'm using bad grammar on purpose, and you put out a smell that was compelling enough, you would draw people to your restaurant. I heard about what may be the world's craziest restaurant up in Detroit around Eight Mile Road. A Jew that owns a major delicatessen who was converted, Bruce Lichtman, told me the man that owns this crazy restaurant cooks the best steak in Detroit City. He said his restaurant is a complete shambles of a falling down building. And if you go to get the steak, he may say, watch the restaurant, I'm going out, I'm leaving. 
He said, but if you hit him in the right mood, and he will cook the steak for you. And Bruce Lickman is a high-class professional restaurateur. I mean, the man is smart, and he's spirit-filled, and he's a great travailer for the Jews. And an unusual man, strikingly handsome. He looks like a Jewish superman to me. But he said, if the man will do it, he will make you the best steak you can get anywhere around Detroit. <laughs> and we put up with his strange ways because <laughs> we want the taste of his virtuosity with the steak. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But there's something about flavors in life I want to get to in, in a verse here, chapter 2, verse 10. My beloved spoke and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. When you realize that this world is a great garbage dump, you will be open to hearing this call from the Lord of heaven. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. In 1960, I went to quite an inconvenience and spent quite a bit of money to go to a major eastern city and see a certain prophet. He was a false prophet, and I didn't know it. He was exceedingly clever and exceedingly interesting. And in that meeting, after being there a day or two and having spent a good deal of money, and it was a 500-mile round trip for me, something seized me inwardly and compelled me to rise up and go away from that place. I later learned decisively that he was a wicked man. And he was interested in me and was trying to draw me into the things he was doing. I'm thankful tonight that Jesus Christ called to me and says, rise up and come away. For many things, many times, had he not done it, I'd have been destroyed. I'd have been part of the garbage heap. And I, 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 there's, a, there's a mystique about this verse for me. It's not, not just words to me, but it's a powerful reality. I'm not going to dwell on it tonight. But I want to say that with what's happening in the church today, there is going to be the voice of the Lord coming to many, many, many of his children saying, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. I sense the Holy Ghost in my being. I believe I've heard that word more than once in life. I never related to this verse, but the idea came, and I responded positively the way the voice was calling. I went that way. You, you, but the, the, the thing that the logician will say was, well, Brother Wilbur, where to? Sometimes anywhere but where you are. The four leprous men got up without any, without any great clear directive. They were moving in a twilight zone of understanding. But they got up and they began to move. I felt like reading that verse as sort of a prelude. Glory be to God. <laughs> I want to be among the rise uppers. I don't want to sit somewhere so long that I become part of the uh, cosmic slime. <laughs> I want God to hook his hooks of omnipotence onto me. Because I find as I get older, there is a, an encroaching conservatism that makes it harder and harder for me to get up and go. But I always want to be willing to get up and go for and with Jesus. I don't ever want to get so old or so attached to a thing or so mentally decrepit that when the voice comes, it'll stream over me like moss on an old log. And some braver soul will catch the word on that side and respond to it. I want to hear the word rise up. My love, my fair one, and come away. My wife, Roberta, responded to me like that 22 years ago. And we didn't have any certain place to go. We were trying to follow a pillar of fire. It was so far away we couldn't even see it. We dimly sensed the radiance 
Science had a thermometer 40 years ago that could measure a match struck a mile away. And I believe that God's children have sensors that can sense where the pillar of fire is going in this generation. <laughs> can anybody bear to say amen in this place? That's just simple, simple exhortation I'm giving you. It's kind of classic Christian. It's got a Pentecostal twist to it. I realize that. Uh, they put me through their system and they put a bit of a crimp in me. You know, I bear always a mark, a certain mark. But it was the free one, characterized by freedom. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I want, to, I want to just go through and hit certain verses. I could never begin to unfold this whole Song of Solomon. It would take me, no doubt, years of a certain kind of application. But I can share what the Lord quickens to me. The fragment. I'm a fragmentist. That's the kind of a person I am. It's embarrassing. You know, do you know God can give you a mighty gift that will embarrass you? Christine Gibson of Zion Bible Institute said, My gift crucified me. I was in the pulpit several years before I found that this is a, an instrument of crucifixion here, this wood right here. And it's by the design of God himself. Now, I want to share something that I think is lovely out of this love song. These are just some of the lyrics of the love song, and I hope I get some of the melody right. One and six of Song of Solomon. This is prelude to something. Because I notice as we sang tonight, that as in the song and as in nature, so in the Song of Solomon, the mountains declare something. And among all the places they go to, one of the places they go is to the mountains. I'm interested in mountains. I almost need mountains like John Wright Follett. I don't do all that well on flat land. Brother Peters back there has a feeling about mountains. A lot of you may have it in a way that you're not, you don't realize it, but you've got it anyway. And I'm pleased to dwell around the mountains where you can go up and see, see out and you can have a vista and a landscape and a vision. Hallelujah. But one in six, I want to share just a little bit as prelude. <clears throat> I believe it applies very much to folks like us. It applies to me in a way, but applies more to a people that I see in my eye. One and six of Song of Solomon. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun hath looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. These are thought to be her mother's children, but not her father's. In other words, her stepbrothers. They were dealing with this girl, trying to train her, and they were rather crude and rather harsh in their treatment of her perhaps not even meaning to be. You know how that is with family. I can very easily get harsh with people. And this young girl here, who is destined to become the bride of the bridegroom, she has received some harsh treatment. There are numbers of people in this room tonight who have received, one way or the other from society, some harsh treatment. They made me the keeper of the vineyard. That was for the vineyards. That was for her discipline. But mine own vineyard have I not kept. I want to express a sentiment and a thought here. This girl, who is a country girl, and you might say a peasant, she has been born in crude circumstances, but in body and soul, her real nature is that of royalty or an aristocrat. She has a certain nature of great refinement, but it's out of place in life, and she is yielding herself to the harsh treatment she gets in her environment. And when this verse says, they made me the keeper of the vineyards, but mine own vineyard have I not kept, I'm com completely convinced the commentators are right here that wh what she means by my own vineyard is my own person. I have had to neglect my own person because my stepbrothers have me under such a severe discipline, and I'm yielding to it the best I can. But it's hard.
And there is furthermore an idealistic strain in society that tells you you shouldn't want to cultivate your own person. That's egocentrism or self-centeredness or uh, effeminacy on the part of men. And it's, it's not in order and it's not proper uh, in an ethical sense for you to want to waste time on yourself, on your own person. And so, year after year goes by and her own person is neglected. She's out there in the beating sun and she is experiencing the deteriorating effects of too much sunlight. She is over tanned. It ages you prematurely. The sun is considered, rightly, a destroyer of beauty and always was until this modern flare-up of sun worship. I'm not preaching against anything either. I'm just expressing something. What do you do when your brothers, your stepbrothers, have got you in their grip? And it's righteous. It's a teeth-gritting, righteous, external, objective, legal thing. Your dad's dead. Our dad's gone. We're the men of the house. We run this show. You're going to have to show a profit if we're going to live. You'd be out there in the vineyards. Yes, brothers. She's truly a refined and delicate souled person. Just watch now. What's the solution of being in a trap where your finer sensibilities can never, never, never be cultivated? And this can be true in the church world. You can be caught up in a mad, frenetic rush of ecclesiastical activity and you will be carnal, carnal, carnal with religious flesh. I'm preaching the truth tonight. And I don't want to be mean. I'm going to soften. I want, I want to keep this dialogical. I don't want to be, I want to dominate anybody's thoughts. I just want to present some things for your consideration. I haven't been afflicted very much for some reason. I don't know why. But I've seen many others afflicted all around me. What's the solution? I want to show you the solution. I want to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. These linked up in my thinking today as they never have before. My friends, isn't it good to be loving Jesus? Amen. Isn't it good to be ministering to the Lord and not the house? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not to have our investment in brickstone and mortar, but in human beings, in a true spiritual reality. Chapter 6 and verse 1 of Isaiah, a marvelous verse. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. That's Adonai in Hebrew, is it not, Brother Horrier, there? That would be Adonai, which can be interpreted the sovereign controller. He is higher than our stepbrothers. <laughs> Just because his throne is up there in the dimension that is called transcendent, he rules over everything according to his sovereign good pleasure. And though you seem to be caught in the vice of social religious necessity, when the bridegroom comes by and sees you and says, I want her for myself, he will loose you not because of any selfish desires of yours, but because of his own lordly, godly, transcendental desires that he has in his mind, in his heart. And he will say, I demand that she be loosed from this kind of treatment and this kind of labor. And it is my will that now her person begin to be cultivated because she is my desire and my delight. And lo and behold, the economic machine of the earth the claws of mammon have to relinquish their grip. Jesus says, loose her and let her go. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, my friends, our deliverance may be in, uh, as far as experientially and as far as uh, the empirical uh, state, what we can observe. It may be in some rather uh, low 
and preliminary state of being. But I want to tell you, in Jesus Christ, we are destined to be completely and absolutely liberated from every bondage that is sin or Satan or death or demons or hell or fate or anything else like that. Economic necessity from it all, Jesus Christ will liberate us. You say, when, brother, I do not know when, but it will be in God's time. Hallelujah. And in God's time, when God speaks, explosive energies will be released in your life, and you will come out free. Hallelujah. I am preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. He is this bridegroom in this story. And John says, he is the one that Isaiah saw sitting upon the throne that is high and lifted up, which just doesn't mean a good deal higher, but it is absolutely transcendent to everything else. It's in another dimension. It's of another quality of a wholly different character that men and devils have never understood that when this God speaks down from that dimension and throws his word into the earth, it liberates people no matter how hopeless the situation is. I feel like telling about my friend Freddie Upton who was an Assembly of God pastor years ago. Freddie may be gone now from the earth. Haven't seen him for years. Graduated from Elam Bible Institute in 1934 when they had to forward move and all those manifestations over by Lake Ontario at Red Creek. Freddie Upton was a man who didn't believe in killing human beings and he got drafted into the U.S. Army when World War II was beginning. And he thought about his plight so much, and Freddie was a very refined, he was of English descent, took care of his mother till she was very, very up in years. And Freddie was a, a, a really a kind of a perfectionist, a fussy kind of a man. He was a genius at door-to-door -door visitation, as few pastors in the world are. He was an absolute genius at door-to-door -door visitation. And when he got in the army, he thought about his plight, and he thought until he went crazy. And Freddie began to shake all over his body one day like this and the army authorities took him to a, an army mental institution. He just went, he just cracked up because he couldn't reconcile being in the army and didn't believe in killing anybody. That's a pretty extreme place when they're carrying you to the snake pit, isn't it? They took him into a building where men roared like lions, writhed in the full like snakes, didn't wear clothes, and ate their food out of, out of cement troughs like animals because it could be no instrument because they'd take them and hurt their bodies with them. They carried Freddy in that place trembling and there was a demoniac in a cell. When they brought Freddy by, the demonic leaked to his feet, rushed up to the bars, looked out at Freddy and said, the windows of your soul are open. You are a saved man. And the evil spell broke just like that. At a very great extreme, God caused something to happen that established Freddie Upton's salvation. Hallelujah. How many are glad the light shineth in darkness? It doesn't say the light shineth in light. It says the light shineth in darkness. My friends, I want to make a plain moral exhortation. We need to see the Lord high and lifted up. I need to see the Lord high and lifted up. I need to see him enthroned on my financial problems. I need to see him enthroned on my relational problems with other people. I need to see him enthroned on top of what seems to be binding me temporarily. I need to see him as Lord of all these sins that afflict as we go down life's pathway and crush us with a burden of guilt. That's as much as I'll say about chapter 1 and verse 6. I want to express something else now out of chapter 2. I want to read a little passage. Chapter 2, verse 8. I don't know how much to, to read. It precedes what I read before. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, perhaps. Chapter 2, verse 8. <clears throat> the voice of my beloved, and in my King James here, there's an exclamation point. See, there's 
The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, gazing through the lattice. I just want to direct your attention to the dynamic energy that our Lord is filled with. Is this not amazing? This God comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. Where even the most energetic men in this earth toil their way up mountains. He comes leaping and skipping. Riddling with energy, radiating this fantastic superabundance of life. Hallelujah. <laughs> He gets you awake. <laughs> he is packed with this power, this energy, this virtue, this grace, this desire, this, this father urge that he had from the beginning. And he walks down the dusty road by Jericho and there's a wretch called Bartimaeus, blind, sitting by the roadside begging. Can you imagine the utter crushing wretchedness of the oriental beggar and Jesus of Nazareth is, is, it's rumored that he's coming by and he cries out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus Christ stops and doesn't come over to the man in what we would consider a full and proper display of, of divine grace and mercy. But Jesus stops and leaves a space between Bartimaeus and himself and he says, take a message to the beggar. Tell him to get up and come to me. Jesus gets men on their feet. Jesus gets people on their feet. You say, he's cruel. The beggar has to expend his last meager energies. He may not even make it. Jesus knows that he himself has such energy. He can easily repay the beggar for any expenditure he makes in getting to Jesus because Jesus' touch is going to be upon him. Jesus' word is going to penetrate into him. He's going to receive his sight. He's going to experience a thoroughgoing, transfiguring touch from this man called Jesus, the son of David. <laughs> oh, I, a greater miracle than the receiving of sight is changing him from a sitting posture to a standing posture to going along the way with Jesus. Jesus imparts dynamic to him. He couldn't sit. He would be like the black spiritual where they, the people, the choir sing and one says, sit down. And the other say, can't sit down. Then they say, sit down. And they say, can't sit down. Sit down. Can't sit down. I just caught religion and I can't sit down. <laughs> I can't sing it, but I know that many words about it. He will charge you with life and energy, purpose. Now I want to pass on to another idea that I think is utterly germane to the day we live in. Chapter 2 and verse 15. I will refrain from reading a lot of those things. I just want to pick out a few simple things tonight. Chapter 2, verse 15. Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Now the commentators feel that Solomon has come north from Jerusalem to hunt foxes because they're spoiling the vines. Friends, how long are we going to allow these contemporary foxes to chew the tender shoots off the vine, thus ensuring there'll never be a harvest, a vintage, or the wine of joy pressed out? How long do we allow these late 20th century foxes to chew at the vines. How long before a wise Solomon rises up in indignation and says, we're going fox hunting. We're going to attack this problem and solve it. 
And so the commentators feel that Solomon has come north with a party up to the young girl's home area, and he will see her and he will hunt foxes and kill them because there has got to be for the church the wine of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? amen. We must have it. And the idea expressed in verse number 17, which says, Until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roar, a young heart, upon the mountains of Bether. What's behind this is he will be hunting foxes for a time, and then he will come back to her across the mountains. Bether means separation, and I think many have misunderstood the phrase mountains of separation and spiritualized it and put a mystique there and derived all kinds of things out of it. The bride and the bridegroom will be separated for a time, that's true, but what mountains of Bether means is it means something like a castellated ridge. It means these mountains have a series of separated peaks. That's what separation really means in its plain and simple meaning. And it means that when you traverse these mountains, you're presented with difficulty. It's hard, hard to get across them. Barbara Seo's husband, who was here for a few years, was a 46er. He'd been up all 46. 4,000 plus peaks in the Adirondacks, of which there are actually only 43, but the old surveys were off the beam and they never changed the, the title 46ers. And she told me he went up 13 major peaks in one day. That is a man killing day. I'm talking about mountains of challenge, of difficulty, perhaps of even ordeal, where you think you won't even make it. I never thought when I was a young Christian I could ever be presented with anything that would really be a severe challenge to me. After being saved for 15, 20 years, it finally hit me. And I need the Lord's help and the Lord's grace to get through these mountains of difficulty and challenge. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to express something. How is it the song goes? What's the song say? The mountains? What, what's the phrase? The mountains declare it. He is Lord. Now, the mountains in the Song of Solomon declare something. They have an unmistakable message, and I want to share some of that that the Lord quickened to me some years ago and brings it back to me from time to time. We have already seen the mountains of challenge here and of difficulty. Now, let's drop down with me to chapter 4 and verse 8 of Song of Solomon. I think I will just deal with one verse here and then the final verse in the book. Can you praise the Lord's name tonight? God is a good God. The Lord loves his people. Earthly circumstances make us feel unloved and even get a sense of God forsaken us, but God Almighty loves his people, and his word, when his word really breaks through, and when the Holy Ghost really breaks through, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, and we have evidences that he loves us, and our faith is stimulated. Verse 8 of chapter 4 of Song of Solomon. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amanah, from the top of Sanir, and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. Briefly, I want to express what these mountains are declaring here. I would almost see this as an excursion in the kingdom of God because he invites her to go on a northern sightseeing trip with him. He invites her to come up to the top of this great mountain, and if you were looking at Israel, I don't know if I would need to refer to my Bible map, but just for the sake of orientation, I love to be oriented. I'm a, I have a great deal of thought about that. But the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea, which is angled about like that according to my map, and there's the great Jordan Rift Valley coming down through here with the Lake of Gennesaret, and then the Dead Sea down here. Up in here where the Jordan begins, along the seacoast, very close, 
I don't know how many miles in, about less than 20 miles in, there is Mount Lebanon, which means the White Mountain. It comes up there like this. And there's a hollow in between called Hollow Syria. And over here, some distance away, is the Ante Libanus, like this. In other words, here's a mountain range, here's a mountain range, and there's a valley in between, and over here is Syria. And so he is saying to her, come with me up to Lebanon, which is over 10,000 feet high. There is a tremendous view from Lebanon. There's a tremendous vision granted. And then from Lebanon they go down the mountain, through the valley, up onto this other ridge, which is Hermon. And in, the, in, in those places, in those times, the peak called Sinir was up here. The peak called Amana was somewhere in the middle. And the, the southern peak was called Hermon itself. And I just want to express what these mountains are telling us, if I might, for a brief time. Hermon has the connotation in the Semitic languages of abrupt. It's a mountain precipice. And the way it's interpreted through its etymology and its linguistic ramifications is consecration. This peak here is a very steep and abrupt peak. And it demands a consecration of God's people. How many of you think that the way the church is in America right now, there's a tremendous need for some old-fashioned consecration? I have discovered that when we deteriorate in the element of dedication or consecration, sooner or later, your religious organization gets permeated with a secular sense. You feel just like all the rest of the world. It has that secular, worldly, carnal feel to it where there is no more any sanctifying or transforming power. And so Herman is declaring a message to us. This other mountain up here, Sanir, which may mean just peak. The rabbinical commentators of ancient times, some of them declared that Sanir was a place, and the meaning would be rendered, a place where the fruitfulness is so fantastically luxuriant that most of the fruit just goes to waste. A mountain area that was phenomenally productive in fruit. But some other rabbinical commentators give another idea. The mountain that resists the plow. It was hard land to break up. Now they seem like contradictory ideas to begin with. But you know, I lived in a place that was very rocky in the mountain behind my house, you couldn't even sink a pick into the ground. There were so many sandstones dumped by the glacier. But if you could succeed in cultivating the land on our mountain, back in Pennsylvania, I mean, the productivity of that soil was phenomenal. And that reminds me of a statement of Jesus in John chapter 15. I want to quickly look at John 15. John fifteen sixteen. Well, there are several verses here. Let me just read these, this progression in John 15, 1. I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every vine in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. <clears throat> Verse 8 says, And this is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Verse 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And you and I both know that all through the Christian age it has been enormously difficult to bring forth the specifically Christian kind of fruit in this world. But those saints that persist are rewarded with great harvest. Hallelujah. 
So I decided to combine the meetings because I lived it in my own home. I lived on a land that was hard to cultivate, frustrating. You should have seen the tons of stones I picked from our garden. Tons and tons and tons. And every year the frost brought up new ones to the surface. Unlimited supply. In fact, the old timer said stones grow here. They actually, little grain of sands become big sandstones. They actually believed that, superstitious people. I have seen fields in our area where when it rained, the surface of the earth was completely obscured by stones. You could see no dirt at all. But we raised great corn, great tomatoes. Almost every crop was superior there if you could endure the difficulty of digging up the earth. This central peak is the one that by far interests me the most. I'm only going to say a few more things here. Just, you might say, a few, a few impressionistic brush strokes, a few suggestions about this. They're going to look, they're going to look from Lebanon, they're going to look from Amanah, they're going to look from Senir, they're going to look from Hermon. There's going to be vision. And this central peak right here is a place where the Amanah springs are located. There are water springs that never, ever go dry, never have in history. They are where the great river of Syria, the Barada, takes its rise. Those springs there in that mountain could be called the Amen Springs of Amen Mountain. The writer is saying, Church, come with me to the peak experience of the positivism of God. His faithfulness, his firmness, his unchangeableness. Come to the realm where all no's have been left behind and only yes prevails. I want to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I read a phenomenal theological sermon on this years ago by one of the great European thinkers. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Paul says to the Corinthians, I had tried to visit you and I was frustrated and now you think I... And fickle. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, he says, When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness or fickleness, or my purpose, or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay. One translation says, Do you think I have a yes that may turn out to me no? We've all been disappointed by people, haven't we? But as God is true, says Paul, our word was toward you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Sylvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it was only yes. Or as one translator says, in him God's eternal yes has finally sounded. The yes that transcends all yes and no's. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. That is Amen Mountain, the mountain that reminds us of the unchangeable faithfulness of God. Water springs never fail. I'm just going to let the mountains declare one final thing here tonight. The final verse in verse number 14 of chapter 8. Pardon me for taking so long. I hadn't planned to take nearly so long. <clears throat> the bride says, Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like a row or a young heart upon the mountains of spices. This last phrase, mountains of spices, was chosen with precise design by the writer of this book. It gives us to understand that all the mountains of difficulty, the mountains of challenge, the mountains that have caused us so much pain and grief, have given way to the sweet smell of conquest. Every battle's over. The victory has been won. The mountains of separation, that means of craggy, 
One could say the craggy mountains have been transformed into the spicy mountains. Hallelujah. Painful yearning has changed into fulfillment. They shall see eye to eye, says Isaiah. That means prophesying, prophesying, prophesying has given way to a physical, concrete reality that you can see with the eye and grasp with your hands. Hallelujah. The mountains declare something, a message. Hallelujah. Can you praise the Lord tonight? Stand with me if you please.